You're listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff, with co-host Eleanor Goldfield. And in this segment, we're going to revisit sort of one of our um, sort of salon-like sessions where Eleanor and I talk about key issues happening around the world through a critical media literacy lens. We talk about media coverage. We talk about censorship and its many guises. We deconstruct numerous propaganda campaigns that are um, basically unending and seemingly around a few different topics they never end. War and peace is one of those big topics where we see that uh, challenge routinely, unfortunately. And Eleanor, um, also unfortunate, we have the ongoing conflicts in Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine, although that war has seemed to have gone down the memory hole since the Hamas attack on Israel of October 7, where all eyes have been on Israel. And even in the Western press, we've seen in the last week or so, more attention on Palestinian deaths and the carnage taking place literally uh, in Gaza, which is um, horrific that it's happening, but it's interesting that media coverage is beginning to somewhat shift and maybe there are some cracks in the narrative in the West, the U.S. pro-West, pro-U.S., pro-NATO, um, pro-Zionist, pro-Israel stance that's almost 100% in the media in the West, the corporate media. Eleanor, we're seeing such extraordinary uh, reaction for these attacks from Hamas that we're even seeing APAC people like Wolf Blitzer over at CNN show empathy and sympathy for civilian deaths in Palestine. But I, there's a number of things that I know that you want to talk about and that you've been talking about on your other platforms. And I'm glad that we're going to be able to do it today and we can do it for the Project Censored audience. So, Eleanor, let's just get started. There's a lot to unpack here in that regard. And also, you know, there's ongoing atrocities, particularly the deaths of civilians, the deaths of journalists. Um, we're over a couple of dozen deaths of journalists covering this issue. So many things to discuss and unpack. Eleanor, kick it off for us. What's um, one of the things you want to talk about first? Yeah, so Mickey, I, I do I do want to start off by saying that, yes, there are cracks in the facade of the Israeli propaganda machine. And I think that that speaks to a lot of things, and one of them being the power of the people to to shift this narrative. And lest we forget, this is not this did not start on October seventh, right? <laughs> uh, this started in somewhat before nineteen forty eight. Uh, and so people have been trying since then to shift the narrative to Israel has a right to exist, to defend itself, to be a home for all Jews, particularly the whitest ones, uh, lest we forget that uh, Israel has a habit of doing things like forcibly sterilizing black Jews. So the idea that it's a home for all Jews is in and of itself incorrect. So I do want to say that, yes, the facade is cracking and you have people like Wolf Blitzer, who used to work for APAC, <laughs> uh, pushing a little bit against an IDF spokesperson who was on his show and saying, but you did know that you were bombing a refugee camp that was filled with women and children. Like you knew that, right? Uh, and this, the IDF spokesperson kind of dances around the question and then Wolf pushes him again. And this is something that you never would have seen from the likes of Wolf Blitzer just uh, you know a month ago or something. So I do want to highlight that that is happening. But at the same time, like Truth Out recently reported, the mm -hmm. Biden administration has requested that arms deals with Israel be done in complete secrecy because they know that public opinion is against them. So the system is trying to ensure the, the per perpetuation of support for Israel as an apartheid and now genocidal state can continue, but on the down low, while public opinion continues to shift. So I think it's important to recognize that both of those things are true at the same time. And uh, with that, I, 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 wanted to, uh, I wanted to highlight uh, another important connection mm -hmm. that we have here. Uh, of course, you uh, you and uh, Kevin Gastola in particular have been doing these episodes that focus on WikiLeaks and Assange for, for years now. And I just wanted to highlight that some of the cracks in the facade that we're seeing can mm -hmm. also be uh, laid at the 
uh, can be thanked uh, to, to, to WikiLeaks for giving us those cracks because already back in 2007, for instance, and, and folks can follow WikiLeaks on, on Twitter and on Instagram, and they've been posting images of these cables, for instance, like uh, this one from Israeli Defense Intelligence Chief in 2007, quote, Israel would be happy if Hamas took over Gaza because IDF could then deal with Gaza as a hostile state, end quote. I mean, this also lines up with reports that we've been seeing that uh, Netanyahu wanted the uh, the attacks on Israeli citizens to happen on October 7th because it would give him the ability to, to move ahead with this, right? Um, and uh, and we, we see similar cables uh, back in 2008, for instance. Uh, U.S. officials were told by uh, Israel that it, they wanted that Israel wanted to keep Gaza's economy, quote, on the brink of collapse, while at the same time just barely avoiding a humanitarian crisis, which is, of course, what they've absolutely done. Now, although I wouldn't say they've been avoiding a humanitarian crisis, but so these are cables that WikiLeaks has shared with us over the years that allows people to see behind that very facade that we see cracking more and more now, Mickey. Well, and Eleanor, we've seen other leaked documents suggesting historically that part of the plan around the attacks was to create a forced relocation or to push the Palestinian population uh, into Egypt or somewhere. I mean, the whole way the corporate media has been reporting and we're reporting this, you know, the idea that the Israeli government was was warning Gazans to leave. Where are they going to go? Um, I mean, again, this has pejoratively been re referred to as the largest open air prison in the world. You know, Abby Martin's film, Gaza Fights for Freedom, shows that Menar Adlai and Mint Press have done many doc, you know, documentary video footage around this. We've seen it over and over and over again. What's missing in the Western press often is that historical context. Um, just like what's often missing is agency. Um, when we see re reports, Eleanor, of Israelis dying, there's always somebody doing the killing and doing the atrocities. When we see Palestinian civilians, well, actually, we don't usually get to see civilians because they don't usually cover the Palestinian deaths. But now it's happening so openly and wantonly, it's impossible not to discuss or cover it. The degree to which that even people like Wolf Blitzer on CNN basically cornered the IDF spokesperson and said, yeah, but like, isn't this, aren't you bombing hospitals and killing civilians? And, you know, the, the person basically was admitting that they were, but like it wasn't, that was the goal. And so the audience should just shift its perception that that's okay, the goal. I mean, there's a lot of like, I mean, to, to suggest it's gaslighting is maybe almost too obvious, but there doesn't seem to ever be anybody pulling the trigger or dropping the bomb when Palestinians die, right? It's just a passive right. language. And, you know, if you're not following Alan McLeod's work from Mint Press News on Instagram or other places, I'd recommend that too. He does like a real-time deconstruction of, headlines you know where where he's talking about uh, the current uh, palestinian migration like the new york times is acting like this is a migration as if like people are picking up and saying like it's time to go do something else when it's i mean people are just being murdered mm -hmm. in cold blood eleanor you know just a couple of those things with the media analysis i mean they're they're patently absurd yet normalized Absolutely, Mickey. And I think this also speaks to the critical media literacy that that, that Project Censor does, which is re being able to read a headline and questioning, okay, but how how did they die? Like, the, and, and, and why are you phrasing it that way? And one of my favorites that Alan McLeod, I don't know how he finds all of these, to be honest with you, but one of my favorites that he, that he shared was on October 14th, it's a Reuters headline. And it reads, quote, Reuters journalist killed in Lebanon in missile fire from direction of Israel. Yeah. <laughs> from the direction of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary, uh, the twisting, the turning. I mean, you know, I mean, again, again, I mean, we could sit here and read the things that Alan has collected uh, all, all day long. Um Another one of the issues is how the media was falling over itself about the 40 beheaded babies. Um, but then whenever it comes to any other Israeli war crimes, it's some Gazans say, or, you know, again, there's this, there's always a qualification that 
lend skepticism to one side and automatic belief on the other. And look, there's atrocities abounding here. I mean, that's another unfortunate reality, which is why there's been record numbers of people protesting, calling for a ceasefire. We had over a quarter million people in Washington, D.C. There are people all over the world. Sacram I mean, uh, there are people in Sa San Francisco, Washington, D.C., London, Paris. And another thing that we see happening is the corporate media, like they always do, they grossly undercount the number of people. It's almost as if Donald Trump's inauguration bean counters are in charge. They they never, you know, in the opposite way, somehow, they either overcount one thing or, or undercount another, depending on the topic. And we've got over a quarter million people in Washington, D.C., yet at the Washington Post, it's some people came out to protest on Sunday afternoon after brunch. Or, or in San Francisco, there's record numbers of people. They, they're like thousands of people march. Look, I remember this 20 years ago with Iraq. There were a quarter million people in the streets of San Francisco, and they said 10,000 people showed up to talk about something bad. This is just another part of the propaganda. And, you know, again, and Democracy Now! Just, uh, just to remind people that this is Monday, November 6th that you and I are talking, and we're pre-recording this, so... When people hear us next week and complain about all the things we didn't accurately predict, they can remember this. Um, but Eleanor, what what do you want to say about that issue? It's again, it's back to framing the corporate media. There are cracks in that facade. There are, and again, Piers Morgan, even you know, one of the staunchest cheerleaders for you know the permanent war state. Even Morgan has had to to be to reluctantly admit that this coverage is biased and these things are problematic. What else can you say about this, Eleanor? I know that you were out and about witnessing firsthand how many people are at these protests. What can you say to that? Yeah, Mickey, I mean, I, I too remember the Iraq war and, and remember coming home from protests and being like, that was that there were way more people. And uh, but this is uh, this is classic. And I and this is also why frontline journalism is so important. And, you know, uh, I'd like to take this moment to also point out that there are people inside of Gaza that are still reporting so that we can have information, so that we can actually know what is going on. And those people are the real journalists. Those people are the real heroes, to be perfectly honest. And I, and, and again, like going back to how this is framed, like, yes, we can, uh, you know, I don't even want to throw him a bone, but you could say like, oh, thanks, Wolf, for, for actually like doing something quasi-journalistic for once. Um, but he, he still allowed the IDF spokesperson to say, well, that's where Hamas was hiding. And it's unfortunate that they hide in refugee camps where there are Human women and children. Shields. Right. Human shields. And I'm like, that's just, that's such BS. Like, why would you let him get away with that? But of course that is, it's important for people to, to, to walk away from that broadcast thinking, well, that IDF spokesperson didn't really have it all together, but at least, you know, what, are, what is he going to do? Hamas is hiding amongst uh, amongst babies. So what are we going to do? We have to bomb the baby. Like it's it's that kind of like what is the takeaway there? Uh, and so the takeaway from corporate media, I think, still is largely okay, but Israel still has to defend it, defend itself. Um, and this continues even though you, you know, like the even the UN has been unwilling to say Israel has killed UN officials. They just are like, unfortunately, uh, you know, what, what is it now? It's like it's dozens of UN officials have died, have died, have been killed. But how? What What happened? So, Did they all get the flu? Like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Have, again, it's the passive voice. And look, again, I'm going to remind listeners that you and I are talking on Monday, November 6th. This program doesn't air until the following week. Um. But we have reports, we're talking about at least 10,000, uh, right, deaths in Gaza, just in Gaza. Um, we're looking at 18, heads of 18 United Nations agencies and NGOs issued a joint statement calling for ceasefire. Um, it, again, expressing complete horror that this has to stop. It's been a month. Uh, a quote from that statement is, quote, we need an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. It's been 30 days. Enough is enough. We must stop now, unquote. Uh, so we are seeing more and more people coming out and saying what's happening here is, I mean, is is a, a gross violation of international law. And again, this is not an apologist for Hamas in any way. Um, 
But it's curious too, and I want to go back to Alan McLeod because one of the things that he does as a media scholar, and again, I think that that's something that needs to really be specifically and purposely inserted into this conversation, critical media literacy. When you take a look at the press, the Western press in particular, it's a steady drumbeat of propaganda, right? Um, McLeod went on to talk about um, why Israel must fight on. There, he talks about how Biden is warning that the, the arms deals with Israel need to be done in total secrecy. He's talking about, well, here's another thing that they are covering and, and things that they are saying. Uh, there was another article by uh, Andrew Roberts, an historian, that said, for a better tomorrow, Palestinians need to forget historical grievances. Well, isn't the whole argument behind what's happening with Israel an historical grievance? Um, I mean, again, when you go and look at media scholarship and you look at the people that are attuned to media propaganda and you look what they have to say about these kinds of news developments, I think that they should be side by side with foreign policy experts, policy analysts, et cetera, because without understanding the function of media, we don't understand the control around the narratives, the messaging, and what's newsworthy and what isn't, who's a worthy victim, who's an unworthy victim. We've talked about this at length on this program, Eleanor, and we're seeing much more of it. We're seeing more and more um, coverage that, despite the fact that there are cracks in the facade, the overwhelming majority of uh, reports coming from the West are downplaying what's happening and continuing to lend credibility to uh, that in many cases um, mirror Zionist propaganda. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, Mickey. And it's, uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. Is, is the primary bankroller for the apartheid state of Israel. So it's not uh, it's not surprising to see that. And I, you know, when you were talking, I, I was reminded also of other euphemistic language. For instance, people are calling for a ceasefire, which means that you just stop. <laughs> Right, like technically, we have a ceasefire with uh, with with North Korea. There was never actually a a, um, a like a, a sit down at a peace table and something official signed to end it officially. So ceasefires can obviously last quite a while, uh, and that's why it's so important to call for one. But what what other officials in the U.S. have been calling for, and what apparently the Biden administration called Israel and asked for, was a humanitarian pause. What, what is that? What does that mean? Like that, that is absolutely absurd euphemistic language to suggest that you're doing something that is humanitarian when in reality, humanitarian pause is, is, is purposely vague enough so that you don't have to do anything outside of what you were already doing, but you get to put a stamp on it that says we did the right thing. We did the good thing. And even that Israel wasn't willing to accept. Even that they were like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Uh, and of course, then the Biden administration gets to go, well, we tried. When, of course, in reality, if 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 the U.S. actually wanted to push Israel on something, they could really throw that leverage behind it, hold it being the ones who hold the purse strings. Uh, and, you know, let, let's just say that even even on one single issue, let's say the issue of journalists and free speech and free press. Uh, lest we forget, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Biden talked about how important it is to have a free press and da 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 da. Uh, okay, so, so, okay, Joe, if you really care about that, how about the recent Reporters Without Borders uh, report that showed that since October 7th, at least 31 journalists have been killed, right? 26 Palestinian, four Israeli, and one Lebanese. Uh, and this investigation by Reporters Without Borders found that these groups of journalists were targeted by Israeli forces. Uh, and they say, quote, two strikes in the same place in such a short span of time, just over 30 seconds with regards to this one reporter, Abdullah, from the same direction clearly indicate precise targeting. So Israel is targeting, just like they did with the Great March of Return. They are going after journalists. And this is this is horrific. And of course, it's to silence the stories, right? To silence the truth from getting out. And do any of the Western, do any of our Western uh, corporate comrades in arms in journalism say anything like you're killing our colleagues, uh, you're targeting them, the Israeli forces are targeting journalists? I, I haven't heard much. Uh, I haven't heard anything about that from 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 the corporate media, Mickey. Have you? <laughs> These aren't accidents. We're seeing people that are trying to tell the stories 
of wanton destruction and murder, if not outright genocide, but some now are calling it clearly genocide that we see this happening. If people want to argue and debate that, that's another issue. But we're clearly seeing the wanton death of civilians, including journalists. What can you say about this, Eleanor Goldfield? Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, the uh, Reporters Without Borders has issued uh, has has issued, they've actually filed a um, a complaint with the International Crim Criminal Court as well about this targeting of press. Uh, but they released a report that shows that uh, that the the journalists who have been who have been killed. <laughs> Since October 7th, the, the vast majority of them Palestinian, 26 Palestinian, four Israeli, and one Lebanese. Uh, in particular, one uh, one Reuters journalist, Issam Abdallah, was killed in southern Lebanon on October 13th. And the Reporters Without Borders says in their report that specifically his he was targeted by uh, IDF twice in just over 30 seconds, two strikes in the same place. Now... Um, I'm not a military woman, but that, as the report suggests, shows that you were going after a specific person, right? You're yeah. going after that specific target. You didn't just- And their the families. And families of journalists. Of course, of course. Um, and just like we saw with the Great March of Return, right? They are going after press, but they're also going after vulnerable people. That includes children, that includes elderly, because these people are oftentimes the adhesive, the glue of community, right? Uh, the children being the future of a culture and the elders being the, the memory keepers, the memory holders. A lot of these elders who were at the Great March of Return were even marching with the keys that they had from the homes that they were forced out of. In 1948. So these the, the, the IDF go after the most vulnerable uh, and important parts of a community. They've and they have they they've done this since the beginning, right? They they have become really really good at this. And you know, like you said, Mickey, shooting the messenger. This is this is how you try to ensure that your propaganda, that your story, is the one that is plastered all over global news, and not the story of the people who are there living it and who can say, "Yeah, no, I saw them bomb the hospital. I'm standing next." to it, right? They don't want those stories to get out. Uh, so it's vital to target these journalists. And so we're seeing that in real time. And those that are still alive and able to get the messages out have been vital in perpetuating the truth that Israeli forces have and will continue to shoot the messenger here. Uh, and Reporters Without Journalism, as I pointed out, has also filed uh, 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 filed an investigate or has requested an investigation by the prosecutor of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, to investigate this uh, because these are, of course, war crimes. And you know, this is not to say that other things that aren't have. Of course, there are war crimes every second in the ongoing genocide. But specifically with with regards to journalists, these are also war crimes uh, going after journalists specifically. So. Eleanor Goldfield, I wanted to, to read a quick quote since you've been and we've been talking about Reporters Without Borders, rsf.org. I know some people may may say, what how does that mean? Uh, how does that translate? Well, it's it, it translates from from French um, Reporters Without Borders, um, Reporters Sans Frontiers, rsf.org. And I wanted to read a statement very quickly from RSF Secretary General just to give some context here, since 2000, um, RSF has not seen a war begin with so much violence against journalists. Israel's attack on Gaza in response to the massacre committed by Hamas will go down in the history books and in the annals of journalism as one of the cruelest episodes for reporters as well as all other civilians. The Israeli government should realize the horror does not justify horror. The state of Israel will have to take responsibility before history for the deaths of journalists on a scale unknown in the 21st century. RSF, Reporters Without Borders, call on the Israeli authorities to end the bombardments which amount to war crimes. This disastrous toll adds a new blood-colored stain to an already tragic story. More journalists have been killed in the course of their work in two weeks in the Middle East than in Ukraine since February 2022 as a result of the Russian invasion. This is the sad reality of a grim toll. So we're talking about record numbers of reporters being killed, Eleanor. Yeah, absolutely, Mickey. And with, uh, with that, I think it's important to note that uh, I can't recall the exact number 
uh, but the UN had had estimated that roughly nine ninety one hundred uh, people have died in the uh, in the war in Ukraine since it began, and we're already over ten thousand people in Gaza who have been murdered. So yeah. just to just to, just to give people an idea of what we're looking at in terms of uh, in terms of the amount of time that this 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 specific bombardment has been happening and the loss of life is astronomical. Uh, and I, I, I personally can't wrap my head around it. Uh, and again, this, this of course speaks to the importance of, of journalists, of, of getting people, of getting the story out there. Um, and this is also, Mickey, why I think it's so important to have not only critical media literacy, but the access to it. And, you know, we've seen even before October 7th, you know, if I, if I posted a video or something that said like Israel and Palestine in it or something, it would just immediately get, I, I'd get like two views or something. Um, and I know that this is the case with a lot of folks. And, you know, we, we look at places like Mint Press News that have been absolutely uh, tarred and feathered by the powers that be because they so frequently talk and have talked about what's been happening in Palestine and specifically Gaza for years. And this is that that kind of the covert aspect of you know you're not shooting a journalist right you're not uh, you're not telling some you're not sh jailing somebody but you're shadow banning them you're yeah. ensuring that the that those stories don't reach people so that when somebody outside of my filter bubble like uh, you know most of the U S goes and 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 types in on on the Google what's happening in in Israel. Are they going to see the reporting from Mint Press News first? Are they going to see Abby Martin's film first? Are they going no. to see Alan McClatt? Like they're not going to see these stories first. And of course, that is that that's absolutely by design. Yeah, it's it's by design. And you know, I also want to point out Reporters Without Borders talks about how this is the deadliest year in Israel Palestine since 2000. A decade ago, there were um, a little uh, nine journalists that were killed there. Um, but again, we've seen this continue. I mentioned again earlier, uh, targeted assassinations of journalists to show how far it's gone since October 7. Um, several people from Palestine today, uh, the channel director, a photojournalist and co-founder of another press agency, they were killed. They were targeted and killed at attacks on their homes. So this isn't, this isn't even just like, you know how we blew up Al Jazeera in the Iraq war, targeting actual, this is actually going after journalists at their homes, killing their families. Um, and I wanted to bring up, I just wanted to bring up one more thing, Eleanor, in the few minutes we had left for this segment, because maybe we should have brought it up first, but better late than never. The criticism of the IDF, of the Netanyahu policies, his party, the right wing of the Israeli government, uh, is in no way an uh, an anti-Semitic critique. I'm not saying there aren't an, uh, aren't anti-Semites uh, out there. I'm not saying that there aren't people that use this opportunistically to advance racism against Israel, which is flat out wrong and disgusting. But criticism of Israeli policy, IDF policy, warfare as it's conducted, is not at all anti-Semitic. And so I wanted to put that out there again because I know some people out there are going to say this show was biased. We only covered these attacks. But again, let's remember it's the Project Censored show. There's no shortage of coverage of Hamas atrocity. There's no shortage of hearing the Israeli IDF, Israeli government, Netanyahu perspective in the media in the West. There's no shortage of it. What there's a paucity of has been is the kind of coverage that we're offering today, the perspective that we're offering that has been so lacking. And so the people listening to our program, thank you for listening to our program. But also we appreciate constructive critiques, but let's also remember that this program is trying to fill a really large hole of what the establishment media don't seem to get around to covering. And even when they do, they don't do nearly an exhaustive job covering it as electronic intifada, mint press news. Um, you know, and we can go on and on. Uh, the Intercept has been doing coverage here. Uh, clearly, uh, there are numerous outlets. Even Democracy Now!'s coverage has been very consistent. It's been um, pretty thorough. It's showcasing different or alternative views. So Eleanor Goldfield, last couple minutes here, I wanted to hear you um, talk a little bit about that tired trope 
of people who get accused on the left in particular of being anti-Semitic in their criticism of Israel and wanted to remind people that leftist critics do not necessarily mirror other critics in this case uh, against the Israeli war in Gaza. Yeah, I mean, and I think that th this this also speaks to the issue of critical media literacy and the trouble with the binary, right? That that th the 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 truth is that multiple things can be true at once, right? Um, and here's that truth: we can abs and must absolutely critique, not critique. We must uh, fight and struggle against the apartheid state of Israel, and we must fight against anti-Semitism. Which, by the way, just to, to, to nerd out for a second, Palestinians are Semites as well. Um, so there's that little thing. But as someone who is Jewish uh, and uh, and grew up Jewish, and my father's entire family is Jewish, first generation born in the United States, all of that good stuff. Uh, I, I'm a card carrying member, okay. Um, and, and I can tell you that it is not anti-Jewish to be against the state of Israel. It is actually anti-Jewish to be for the state of Israel. And I'll just take one minute to explain why. To suggest that Jews only belong in one place is in of itself anti-Semitic because you are saying that we are not welcome everywhere. And just think about how that has related to other groups of people throughout history, right? The idea is that people should be at home wherever they are. And there has actually been a long history since Zionism started in the late 1800s as a movement, as a colonial movement, there has been an equal pushback from Jewish communities saying, no, we are at home wherever we are. And I don't want to go to Israel. I've never lived, I've, I've, this, 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 you know, fairy tale land of Israel. I'm not from there. Uh, and I recommend that people check out Shlomo Sand's book, The Invention of the Jewish People, really fascinating perspective into that history. But I do just want to like basically wrap up here by saying, yeah, we'll never cover everything that the corporate media isn't covering, but it's impossible. I could spend the rest of my life and still at the end of it be like, I got through 15 minutes of what that should have been covered on CNN. <laughs> like it's impossible. Um, so we do our best. And I absolutely think, and this is, uh, you know, um, for 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 those of us listening now, uh, for those of you listening now online, uh, you can check out our Patreon page, and that will also allow you to uh, interact with us and say, "Hey, I'd like to hear more of this or more of that." You can check that out at Patreon.com/slash/ProjectCensored, and we absolutely love to hear from you as long as it's constructive, right? Don't just. I'm I'm very tired of being called a self-hating Jew, so if that's what your feedback is, you can just save it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah Eleanor that's well put and it's important it's really important I think to reiterate um what's happening the loss of life is period a horrendous tragedy um and that can't be forgotten um I think really focusing on media coverage and and, and asking people to expand their or broaden their media diet so to speak around this um is really important and really significant, especially living in places like the US, the alleged land of the free and free press. Um, would also like to remind our listeners that you can go for free to projectcensored.org. Andy Lee Roth, our associate director, has an article making sense of the establishment news media's distorted coverage of Gaza. We have links to 20 years of censored and underreported stories going back, looking at Gaza, Israel, Israel Gaza, and Palestine. We had Robin Anderson, media scholar, did a whole article on big media facilitating Israeli war crimes. Again, looking for those other perspectives. You can go to projectcensor.org for free to see those. And of course, as ever, uh, Eleanor Goldfield and I will be here at the Project Censored show talking about the news that doesn't make the news while analyzing why week after week. And we want to thank you all for tuning in. Eleanor, thank you as ever for the work you do on the show. And thanks for uh, chiming in. and. Uh, being conversant and participant for this session today. Thank you, Mickey. It's always a it's always a pleasure. Indeed. Thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you next time.